Yiddish was a spoken language of roughly three quarters of the world's Jews for the past thousand years. Books were our portable homeland. Books define our national identity. We call ourselves Am HaSefer, the people of the book. And yet, here were books being destroyed. When I first came up with this idea to go rescue the world's Yiddish books, the response everywhere was essentially the same. Don't you know Yiddish is dead? Don't you know no one cares about this culture any longer? Why don't we give you a nice scholarship and you can go off and study in Israel? Why do you have to waste your time with these old books that nobody wants? In those days, they said that, well, all of Yiddish literature was out of print. If you wanted to find an out-of-print Yiddish book, you could go to an obscure book dealer in Amsterdam, or else you might find it in a garbage can in Brooklyn, and there wasn't too much in between. First of all, you have to understand, I was 23 years old when all this uh, came about. I was studying Yiddish literature. Probably would have gone on to a very conventional academic career were it not for this one very basic problem. There were no books to read. Each week, our professor would assign us, oh, I don't know, a novel by any of dozens of major Yiddish writers. So right after class, one of us would race off and be the first one to get to the Jewish public library and find a copy of the book. But for the rest of us, there were no books to be had. So I started putting up notices, you know, little signs on the Jewish delicatessen and the laundromat in the old Jewish neighborhood saying, I'm a young graduate student, I'm looking for Yiddish books. So before I knew it, people are calling up Boxes of books are piled high, and my apartment is overflowing with piles and piles and piles of Yiddish books. And it was somewhere along that point, I got a phone call from my parents, and they said, Aaron, I think you have to come home because the rabbi's given us so many books, we're afraid the second story of the house is about to collapse. And I think it was just about that moment that the Yiddish Book Center was born. Well, I had no clue what the actual work of going around and collecting Yiddish books really entailed. Along with all these boxes of books came letters and postcards uh, from older Jews who would write and say, I have many books to give you, but I'm too old, or I'm too infirm, or there are just too many books. You're going to have to come and get them. So in mid-July of 1980, I set out on my very first collection trip. I had received a postcard which came from an elderly man, and I, I knew already how old he was because it was a penny postcard which came postage due. So he writes in this very scratchy handwriting, he said, I'm a very old man, I am leaving on a trip to Israel, I'm afraid that I might not return, and if I don't, I'm afraid they will throw away my books, will you please help me? I show up at noon, and in this tiny one-room apartment, all there was was a little small bed, there was a metal table with a hot plate and a million bottles of medicine, and other than that, the apartment was full of boxes and piles of both Yiddish and Hebrew books. Well, I figured, all right, you take the books, you put them on the hand truck, you roll them out to the truck, far tick, and you move on to the next stop. Uh, it wasn't to be. He sat me down at the table, he says, oh, no, no, he says, young man, young man, which became sort of my generic name in the Yiddish world, he says, young man, he says, I first have to tell you about each of these books. He began handing me every one of these books, one volume at a time. He says, this book here, my wife and I, we bought in 1927. We went without lunch for a week. We should be able to afford it. And this book, have you read this book? Sit down right now, look at this book. It went on for hours and hours and hours. I'm so far behind schedule. At this point, I finally have his books in the truck. I'm about to drive off, and he says, and Manut Jungerman, he says, Vehin Leifste, where are you running to? I said, where am I running? I said, I have other stops to make. I'm already behind schedule. He says, 
Oh, he says, if I state this, you don't understand, he said. And he explained that when he received my telegram, he told all the other people in the building that I was coming. They said, they all have books for you. Let's get to work. I look up. It's like this 12-story high-rise building. I said, all the people have books. That's right, they all have books. Let's start going. We walk into the building. He knocks on every door. People come up with shopping bags and boxes, suitcases even full of books for me. And of course, what do you think you have to do at every single apartment? They bring you inside. They sit you down at the table. They make a glass of tea. They get the Entenmann cakes come out of the box and the Luxe and Kigluch that have been waiting all day come out of the oven. And they feed me and they tell me the story of their books as well. Here I am, 23 years old, you know, in jeans and a t-shirt, but somehow it's fallen on me to try to pick up the fragments of this world and save them for the future. Because when people give you their books, it's a very candid moment in their lives. They're handing you the treasures they've accumulated in their lifetime and they know their own children and their own grandchildren don't want. Invariably, they're crying. Uh, they tell stories with a candor that would probably be very rare in their lives. So it's a very special moment. There was a sort of emotional uh, understanding that, that when people hand you their books, as they say to you, Yunga man, otis man Yerusha, here is my inheritance, this is what I am leaving to the world. What they're leaving to you is a world that is very fast vanishing. It was a world that was shattered in the Holocaust. It was a world that simply vanished under the pressures of assimilation. These were the people who themselves had created a new world. And it was a new world in which very few people were now interested. And so here we were, uh, they had so much to tell us. There was a sort of understanding that what was happening was a moment in history. I mean, I knew that from the very first trip, and I never forgot that, and I have not forgotten it 21 years later. Early on, it became apparent there was no way that a handful of young people were going to be able to you know, round up thousands of what turned out to be hundreds of thousands of Yiddish books. So we organized a network of what we call the Zomlers, or volunteer book collectors. The idea went way back to the early years of the 20th century when Jewish historians of Eastern Europe had called for a network of these Zomlers, or volunteer collectors, to round up communal records. It's been an enormously emotional experience for us our encounters with the Zomlers over the years. For them, this was really, it was cultural preservation. It was saving their own lives and their own life stories. So they had a real urgency in what they were doing. I think the real question, though, is how come so many people care about dusty old Yiddish books they can't read in the first place? When... Uh, my mother's mother came to America. She was carrying with her a valise in which she had everything she had brought with her from the old country. Her older brother met her and took the suitcase and he flung it overboard. Her photographs of her parents, her clothing, uh, her Shabbos candlesticks, everything she had with her was thrown out. He understood that the price of admission to America was to throw the old country away. But I think for my generation, I am finally secure enough in my Americanism that I can now go back and I can dredge the harbor and I can find the suitcase that was thrown out. In the beginning, I was literally hitchhiking from city to city. Every time I would speak, Five people, 10 people, 15 people would sign up as members. So that today, the Book Center is supported by over 30,000 members. They're one of the largest Jewish cultural organizations in the country. We have this wonderful building. 
It gives to Yiddish what we call in Yiddish an address, which in Yiddish means a little more than an address. It means it gives it a place in the world. I will never forget when I stood there that first night after we'd finally moved into the building, Yiddish had finally found a home. But the next challenge was how do you interpret that literature for the 99% of the visitors who can't read those books in the original? So we organize educational programs. We're doing exhibitions. And of course, we have the core of books. We've augmented or established collections of Yiddish literature at 450 major university and research libraries in 26 countries around the world. And then in the summertime, we have groups of student interns who come. We teach them Yiddish in the morning, and they spend the rest of their day going through these boxes in unburying treasures. Now that we don't have to worry about the physical preservation of the literature, we have a much bigger worry. Today, the challenge is how do you open up the books and share the culture with a broader world? And for that, the work's just begun. Thank you.